How do you build an MVP that actually sells? One of the rules, the alleged rules, let me start there. One of the alleged rules you'll hear when you're starting your company is you have to build an MVP. In fact, they'll tell you if you don't build an MVP, you don't have a startup. Well, I'm telling you, if you just follow the rules blindly, you're going to get killed. You don't need an MVP just to build an MVP. If you're going to build an MVP, the MVP actually has to sell. Because if it doesn't sell, you're not going to get any feedback. At least not any useful feedback. You're not going to learn anything. So it's as simple as that. So now that we've said, okay, we know we have to build an MVP that sells. How do we go about doing this? What are the steps? Well, that's what we're going to go through in today's video. I'm going to give you five steps to building your MVP that sells. They're pretty simple. They're pretty straightforward, but guess what? They actually work. So let's get started. What's an MVP? Well, an MVP is just a term, a fancy term for your first product that you build on the cheap. Minimal viable product. The key is the V, viable. Now what's viable? Again, it means it has to sell. If it doesn't sell, it's not viable and you've not learned anything. Because if you haven't sold anything, you're not going to get feedback from paying customers. And those are the only people that matter in all of this. So let's go through those five steps. Number one, talk to customers first. Yes, talk to customers. Reach out to people and ask them, what do they want? What don't they want? And what do, what do they want that they haven't seen anywhere else that nobody else has done for them? Now, all of this feedback is gonna be useful for what are you looking for here? You're looking for things that you can do that are unique and are meaningful to your customers. That's the key. If you can find that, then you're likely to carve out a niche for yourself that's unique in the marketplace. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be really simple, but it's a starting point. It's a toehold for you and your company. Number two, you're looking to build something that is unique. I'm building on point number one here that is unique in a meaningful way. Now, why is this important? Because if it's unique, therefore it's different. There's all this noise you have to overcome when you're starting your company, when you really think about it. The world has gotten along without you and your great idea and your company forever. So how do you overcome this? Well, you build something that's unique. Now, this doesn't mean complex. It can be really simple. In fact, it can be really flawed. And its utility can be really limited. But it's the uniqueness that carries the day. It's the inertia that overcomes all of this. If you ever read Clayton Christensen's great book, The Innovator's Dilemma, it's all about this challenge. It's what's called a disruptive product. Now, what's a disruptive product? It's a product that sells despite its flaws. That's what we're looking for here is we want something that sells even though it's flawed, even though it's limited, even though it may be really difficult to use, it still sells because of the uniqueness. That's the mark of a disruptive product. That's what we're after. Step number three, have what I call an initial objective specification. You've gotten all this feedback. You understand what you think the market wants. Now agree, agree on what you and your team are going to build, which means write it down. Agree on the specs for your product, whatever it is, whether it's a software product, a hardware product, a life sciences product, whatever it is, agree, this is what we're going to build. It's going to have these features. And here's the schedule we're going to agree to to get it done. Actually, you have a schedule. If you want help on building schedules, read Ellie Goldratt's great book, Critical Chain. It's a great book for how to build and manage schedules. But you need a schedule. You need everybody to agree on their part and all the details of the schedule. Now here's the bonus. Have all the key stakeholders actually sign the schedule. Yes, actually sign it. 
Because you know what happens when you force people to sign a schedule? That's when they object. They say, oh, I can't do that. Well, great. That's what you want to hear now. Because if they say they're committed and they don't sign the schedule, and then you find out a month in or two months in or, God forbid, six months in, they can't do what they're telling you that they say they're going to do. Well, then you're screwed. Better to find out at the beginning and then negotiate. This is how you find out. Force all the key stakeholders to sign the schedule. It works. Number four, launch quickly. Even if the product is flawed, get it out on the marketplace. Don't wait for the perfect time. Don't wait for everything to be perfect. Get it out there. Get feedback. Learn. This is so important. Launching is just a day in the life of a company. Nobody remembers when a company launches for the first time. Do you remember when Facebook launched that first day? I don't. Do you remember when Google, if you're old enough, launched? Of course not. You know, it doesn't matter. Just get it out there, get the product in the marketplace, as flawed as it may be, get it in front of your target customers, especially the customers you got feedback from, and start learning and get them to buy from you. That's what's important. That leads me to step number five. Get your customers to pay you something, anything, for the product. As I said, the only feedback that matters is from paying customers. You want customers to pay you for what you're doing, even if it's at cost, even if it's below cost, anything will do. Because a paying customer means that they actually have to commit to you. And that's what you're after. And you want to get this feedback as quickly as possible because that's how you learn what to do and what to do next. I told you this was going to be really simple. These are really simple steps here, but the steps work. Then the final piece of our puzzle, now that we've launched, now that we've gotten our feedback, now that we've learned, what do we do? We do it again, all over for the rest of the life of the company. We launch, we learn, we iterate, launch, learn, iterate over and over again, even if you have multiple product lines. Keep learning from your customers. Keep asking those basic questions. What do you like? What do you dislike? What do you want that nobody else has done for you? If you ask those basic questions and really listen, listen to what your customers are telling you. Understand that they're telling you through their prism what they want. It doesn't mean to follow blindly what they're telling you. That's not great product definition. Great product definition is interpreting what they're telling you. It's saying, oh, they want something that's lower in power, for example. You know, they want something that consumes 10 microamps of power when they really want something that consumes one microamp of power. Now, how do you know this? Well, you understand the market and you understand what they're really telling you. That's the key to great product definition. Really learn, really listen to what customers mean and the directional guidance they're giving you. That's the key to winning. If you understand this piece, that's how you iterate, that's how you get better, that's how you build more features and go beyond that basic product that despite all its flaws, sold and one for you in the business. I hope this helps. I'm Brett at brettjfox.com. Have a great, great day. Thank you.